Hey guys, today we're going to take a look at a little known console from the 90s, one that slowly started to gain popularity as the retro scene began to grow up around it, the TurboGrafx-16, also known as the PC Engine in Japan and in France. This was a collaboration between Hudson Soft and NEC. Hudson Soft, as you may or may not know, was a rather young company, having been established in 1973 and was more well known for making computers and video game software than making game consoles. Most of us likely know them from such titles as Adventure Island, and Milton's Secret Castle. NEC, on the other hand, was known for its electronics and computer manufacturing. What they came out with was a small compact console known as the PC Engine when it launched in Japan. It had an 8-bit processor with a 16-bit GPU and 16-bit video bus. It utilized what was known as Hue cards to store games that were small carts, slightly bigger and fatter than credit cards. Now, these cards were a modification of B cards, which Hudson Soft had been manufacturing for use for the MSX computer system. This was a popular home computing solution in Japan. This allowed them to make the system as small as it was, while letting the games be more advanced than the NES. It also had the advantage of its controllers having built-in turbo switches, and was in every way an upgrade over the aging NES system. The system sold really well when it launched in Japan, giving Nintendo its first real taste of competition since it launched the NES in 1985, quickly starting to outsell the tiny little system. It was easy to see early on why the console was turning so many heads. It had much more powerful hardware and was far, far closer to the arcade experience than people had had from a home console up to this point. People were excited to try the new console, pulled in early by titles like JJ and Jeff, China Warrior, and Keith Courage, it was clear the system was going to turn heads graphically. The system quickly gained a reputation for quality releases, and Nintendo started to take notice. I know what you're thinking, but Sega was Nintendo's biggest rival. Not in Japan it wasn't. The Turbo Graphics actually outperformed it there. Even though Nintendo would start to take the lead in the console sales, the Turbo Graphics continued to perform well in Japan and France. So much so, they decided to try to push the console in the United States. They went back to the design board, and in May of 1989, the system hit the United States. Gone was the small, sleek-looking design of the PC Engine, and in its place was the TurboGrafx-16. They had made the system larger and more industrial-looking to try to appeal to the American market, releasing it in Los Angeles and New York as test markets. The console hit the States and initially sold really well, but quickly started to run into a few problems, the first one being a lack of support from third-party developers. Nintendo had started to bully third-party developers, stating that if they brought a game out on the NES, it couldn't show up on a rival console. Hudson Soft did their best to supply the system with good content, but it wasn't enough to keep the console competitive just on its own. Another reason that they had problems was that the Genesis hit right around the same time, and started out with a very aggressive marketing campaign that appealed more to gamers in the United States than the TurboGrafx's more subtle approach. Part of the reason for this was that NEC and Hudson Soft had listened too closely to retailers and overproduced the number of hardware units that they had, which left them with very little to spend on marketing the actual system. Another reason was that many of the games that they brought over were games that were popular in Japan and didn't necessarily appeal to Western gamers. Sega didn't have any issues with this as they started to bring out multiple platformers and had a much more solid game plan for approaching the Western market. This helped them very quickly take the lead over the Turbo Graphics. Hudson Soft worked feverishly to try to come out with titles that would appear to Western gamers. John Greer, who helped localize many of the games for the system in the States, stated, "That's why you initially saw so many games that reported from Japan and from genre from genres that were popular in that country, like shooters." Hudson Soft and NEC weren't done yet, though, and in 1988 released the PC Engine CD-ROM drive making this the first time that CD-ROMs were used as a storage medium for video games. This came with not only a larger storage, but improved graphics and sound. The system could even play audio CDs as well. This would again put pressure on Nintendo, leading them to try to work up a CD-ROM drive for the Super Famicom. They would start a partnership with Sony, and then eventually Philips, leading us to the CDI and eventually the PlayStation. So, in a way, the TurboGrafx is responsible for those systems. 
They released this in 1990 for the price of almost $300 in the United States to try to bolster interest in the console in the Western market. Around this time, they would also release the Turbo Express, the first handheld console to play full-on console games in a portable format. The Turbo Express came at a premium price of $300 and was intended to compete with the Game Boy. Sadly, it was fraught with multiple problems, from cheap capacitors, a very common problem in the 1990s, and short battery life, roughly three hours out of six AA batteries. This made it one of the shortest battery life handhelds on the market. At the same time, with the Game Gear clocking in at six hours, the Nomad coming in about the same as the Turbo Express, with three hours of battery life, and the Game Boy having an insane 40 hours on four AA batteries. The system also had no way of saving like the main console did, and relied fully on a password save function for players to resume their progress. This didn't stop most of us, including myself, from pining over wanting one in the 90s. The fact that it played full-on console games and had a TV tuner adapter made many a gamer green with envy to see one of these out in the wild in a gamer's hands. It was right around this same time that Hudson Soft was beginning to get unhappy with how NEC was running things in the United States and started to work out a way for them to gracefully exit by forming a new company called TTI, Turbo Technologies Incorporated. This company was to run things in the United States, and it was clear from the get-go when they started that NEC, while great at developing hardware, didn't really know how to pick software for the machine. So, many of the titles that they had chosen to bring out were scrapped in place of others. They would continue to go back and forth with Japan, trying to get things like Mortal Kombat, which they had a verbal agreement to do so, but the Japanese management was shot it down, saying that they didn't want it on the system. They also tried to get Street Fighter 2 ported, but NEC, who was still involved, wasn't willing to put the money into it at this point to localize it. Brandslater, who was running the software side of the US, even reached out to SNK to get some of the more popular titles from the arcades ported, like King of Monsters 2 and World Heroes. Ironically, this deal would go through, but only in Japan. Even using the LA office's idea of the Hue card that would add more memory to the system to pull it off, which you eventually may know as the arcade card. This wouldn't actually happen until things officially wrapped up in the United States. Got even worse, as they would continually submit a list of games that were already out in Japan that they wanted to localize, even offering to do the localization in the States to help keep down costs, but would still get continually turned down and maybe get 1 out of 10 to 15 titles approved after months and months of waiting. Regardless of what they tried, in the States, they just could not get support from Japan to help recover the console and make it a success. It was rather clear that they considered the Western market a loss and just slowly let it die out. And by 1993, with no lineup, no money for marketing, and no one carrying the games in the stores anymore, where you could only get them via mail order, not even a combination of the Turbo Duo unit, which was far ahead of its time in 1992 when it released, could garner any interest in the system in the States in part because they had no software for it and no marketing budget to let anyone know it existed at all. To give you a scope of how bad the discrepancy was between the Turbo Graphics, it only ever saw 138 games, only five of which were third-party licenses. The PC Engine, however, had over 600 games in total and was broadly supported until 1995, with its last game finally releasing in 1999. Hudson Soft would keep the PC Engine alive on the Wii Virtual Store and the PlayStation Store till right around 2011, and was finally purchased by Konami in 2012, bringing an end to the company itself. The brand, well, that began to fade more and more into obscurity until the recent resurgence of interest with the TurboGrafx Mini's release in May of 2020, over a year after it was supposed to be originally released. It seems this system never really could catch much of a break, and almost seems like the poster child of what could have been. In the short lifespan of this console, they managed to push gaming forward into the CD-ROM era, push Nintendo into deals that would bring the world not only the CDI, but the PlayStation as well. Even Sega would release the Sega CD to compete with them. Everyone seemed to see the potential and threat save Hudson Soft and NEC themselves. This left the system only a major hit in Japan and never really a threat anywhere else when it obviously had all the potential in the world to be just that. With smarter software management and more marketing savvy, we could have easily have been talking about how the TurboGrafx almost beat Nintendo or straight up defeated Nintendo in the 90s. However, NEC's inexperience in the gaming industry 
and Japan's lack of faith in a turnaround in the American market led Sega and Nintendo being the main competitors in the early to mid-90s. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video on the Turbo Graphics and what it was about and what it could have been. Honestly, I had to pare down a lot of stuff that caused this system issues. It was really just huge issues of massive mismanagement outside of Japan. At any rate, if you enjoyed this, please give this video a like, and if you see more content that you like, hit the subscribe button and the notify bell. That way you don't miss any content. And until next time, happy gaming.